Uh, we're going to talk about blunt vertebral artery injuries, uh, what their incidence is, and how best to treat them. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant. Basically, uh, blunt cerebral vascular injury is defined by the presence of damage to the carotid or vertebral arteries as a result of non-penetrating trauma. Now, its incidence is much higher when you look for it. It was initially thought to be less than a tenth of a percent, but now it's really as high as between one and two percent. Carotid artery injury can be as high as 1.5 percent, and vertebral artery injury can be anywhere from 0.2 to up to almost a percent. And oftentimes, you see the mechanism is with rapid deceleration uh, with hyperextension and rotation, such as you would get with a cervical fracture. Most, vertebra, most but not all vertebral artery injuries are associated with fractures, and it, it's difficult to really determine the stroke rate. Some people will say, oh, it never occurs that you get a stroke. Other people will say it can happen in up to a third of the time. Now, the problem is when you have a trauma and a stroke, the mortality rate is pretty high. It can be anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. So it's something we really have to pay attention to and identify. Now, what you want to do is have a screening protocol. And there are a couple of different criteria, the Denver criteria and the Memphis criteria for screening of blunt trauma patients. And, and when you use these criteria, you can always see that anytime there's a cervical spine fracture, that immediately um, puts people more uh, at risk for a vertebral artery injury. And it's somebody you really ought to screen for a vertebral artery uh, dissection or, or transection. Now, also the Denver criteria, any explained, unexplained neurologic deficit, a basilar fracture, a Lafort two or three fracture, cervical hematoma or cervical brewery also will, will predispose you to a blunt cerebral vascular injury and you ought to screen for it. In the series from Memphis and Denver, three to 5% of blunt trauma patients met the criteria. And in those patients, there was an 18 to 30% incidence of blunt cerebral vascular injury. So, you know, cervical fracture and vertebral artery injury, what's the, what's the real incidence? This paper from Cothram um, showed that in 605 patients who they screened by angiography, they had 92 patients who had vertebral artery injury. The incidence was 23% in those who had no fracture and 77% in patients who had a fracture. And the three most common types were subluxations, fractures in the frame and transversarum, or C1 through C3 fractures. And in 213 patients who had these fracture patterns, the incidence of vertebral artery injury was up to a third or 33%. Another paper uh, from Level showed that in 253 patients with a C-spine fracture who had a CTA, that 17% had a vertebral artery injury. Neuro events occurred in 14% of those with the mortality rate of 5% uh, in those that had uh, um, some sort of neurologic event or a stroke. So high-risk patients included basilar skull fractures, craniocervical dislocations, obviously, fracture displacement into the foramen more than a millimeter, ankylosing spondylitis, facet dislocations or subluxations. So think about that when you see these patients, and you probably want to screen them for a vertebral artery injury. Now, there's how to classify these things. There's the Denver classification or Biffle classification system for blunt cerebrovascular injury. And you can see that here. And you can see the incidence by grade. The most common are grade one and grade two injuries, um, which are intraluminal dissections. If there's less than 25% luminal stenosis, it's a grade one. If there's more than 25%, it's a grade two. A pseudoaneurysm is a grade three. And a vessel occlusion uh, is a grade uh, four. And so you can see examples of that here. Here's a grade one type of injury. Here's a grade two type of injury with greater than 25% luminal narrowing. Here's a, a grade two injury where you had intraluminal narrowing, plus you also had a thrombus that was forming at distally. Here's a grade three or pseudoaneurysm that you can see there. And here's grade four, which is an occlusion. And then finally, the last one, which is a transection with free extravasation, fortunately pretty rare, but something that needs to be managed by our endovascular colleagues. Now, the rationale for treatment is pretty well defined in the literature. Now, a lot of this is retrospective literature, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. But it, is show, it does show high stroke rates in patients who aren't treated uh, when they have a vertebral artery injury. This is a paper from Biffle over in Denver, where 38 patients with 47 vertebral artery injuries, they had a stroke rate of 24%. And vertebral and vertebral artery injury or stroke uh, was associated with an 8% death rate. So these things were not only causing strokes, but they were causing mortality in these severely injured patients.
The overall incidence, again, for blunt cerebral vascular injury was pretty low, less than a percent, but still not insignificant if you see a high volume of trauma patients. They looked at patients whose outcome was not decided by the injury other than the, the vertebral artery injury, and they found that a stroke rate was at 60% when they didn't anticoagulate the patients. It was only at 6% when they did uh, anticoagulate the patients. Again, uh, Michelle. data and there's a clear selection bias, but is that Jim? <laughs> but there's a clear selection bias, but um, you know, it, it did give us a reason to go ahead and start treating these patients and looking at things more aggressively. Miller looked at 216 patients prospectively screened by angio and about a third, or, or well, almost a third, 30%, had either carotid artery injury or vertebral artery injury. Overall, it was 1.3% in their trauma population. Almost all the patients were treated with heparin or antiplatelets, and overall, the stroke rate was 0% in these patients compared to their historical control, which showed a stroke rate of 14%. So when you're talking about the management considerations for vertebral artery injury, you got to think about what the different uh, risks for stroke are with the different grades of injury. And you can see that here. A grade one injury has a 6% stroke rate. Grade two injury has a 38% stroke rate. Uh, a grade three injury is 27% stroke rate. And a grade four, 28% stroke rate. It is not necessarily that you can say that the higher the grade, the higher the stroke rate. It's just that you know when there's more than a grade one injury, there is a higher stroke rate that you probably need to really uh, yeah, take care of and, and really manage these patients carefully. Now, what's the best screening technique? We've all kind of gone to four vessel angio and you can see the sensitivity rates there, a 98% sensitivity, 100% specificity, 100% positive predictive value, 99% negative predictive value in this study where they compared it to um, a, a carotid angiogram or, or a, you know, DSA. And so you can see there, it has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity rate. Well, not everybody thinks this way. And I don't know if David's still on the line, but this is a paper from Pittsburgh where they looked at 140 patients who had 156 cerebrovascular blunt injuries to the carotid and all patients had CTA and DSA. They found that CTA was incorrect in 61% of the vessels studied and the overall CTA false positive rate was almost 50% in this study. And so suggesting that perhaps CTA can overcall and we may be over treating these patients if we're just looking at CTA. And so what they found again was that Oh, the percent of patients whose therapy changed based on the digital subtraction angiography was 57%. And oftentimes what they'd find is somebody who was called a grade one injury would actually have a negative DSA in 47% of the time. And, and they could you know, often avoid anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy, I should say, in these patients if they went ahead and did DSA. Now I have to take this with a grain of salt because DSA has its own problems. And you know, anybody who's taking care of a femoral dissection or somebody who's had optical or cortical blindness after an angiography or something like that, you have to take it seriously or God forbid, dissected the carotid or dissected the vert. So, so you have to take this with a grain of salt and you know, all apologies to the people in Pittsburgh. You know, what we've done is we've moved away from doing it because one of my partners is the primary author on this. He was doing a lot of DSAs and now essentially it's just not uh, just, you know, the, the downsides of any platelet therapy or an aspirin are really not as great sometimes as the downsides of DSA. So we're not doing DSA on everybody, but just remember CTA may overcall some of these things. Now, when we talk about treatment of asymptomatic uh, cerebrovascular injuries, all trauma, this is a paper from Cothran where they looked at all trauma patients over a 10 year period of time at a level one trauma center, over 18,000 patients. The main outcome measure was uh, a, a, a cerebrovascular accident. And they found that once a, uh, a blunt cerebrovascular injury was identified, treatment was immediately initiated unless contraindicated. They used a mix of both antiplatelets and heparinization. And what they found was that overall, uh, that they, they had um, blunt cerebrovascular injuries in 301 patients, or almost 2% of their trauma population. And you can see here the different grades of injury that they have there. When they treated these patients, what they found is that you can see there, when there was treatment for an asymptomatic injury, the group at the top, they only had one patient who had a stroke out of all those patients that they treated, 282 patients they treated for asymptomatic blunt cerebrovascular injuries. There were no bleeding complications, but if they 
they had to delay treatment or there was no initial treatment for some reason, they found that there was a much, much higher stroke rate in, in those patients, uh, particularly, you know, if you look at that bar there that says contraindications or subtherapeutic um, treatment for, for blunt cerebrovascular injury, they had a 21% stroke rate. The other thing that's important is that when you had a stroke, the mortality rate was 30%. So again, in these multi, multi-injured patients, a stroke is a bad problem to have. There are other observational studies out there that suggest that we should treat these things. This is a paper, a series of paper actually from Scott. They had 143 patients with grade one and two injuries. Um, most of them were treated with aspirin. 97% of the injuries were stable or improved, and only 2 or 2% of the patients had posterior uh, circulation ischemia. Interestingly, <laughs> both of them were on aspirin, but su- they still suggested that if you treated these things aggressively, you still had a low stroke rate. They did actually find significant data in the grade three and four injuries. That was in a subsequent study where they had three patients with grade four injuries who had a stroke and 100% mortality. All of those were not treated with antiplatelets or with any type of endovascular treatment. There are other prospective observational studies that show that um, you can actually lower the stroke rate and lower the mortality rate in these types of injuries when you treat patients with heparin followed by aspirin, as you can see here. Now, I wanted to mention also endovascular treatment of these things. Now, this is something that is not FDA approved, uh, so I have to have to um, disclose that. But it depends on the center and the experience of the neuroradiologists or interventional radiologists who are doing this. And you still need antiplatelet therapy, even if you stent these dissections. So the most common thing you do it for is a carotid artery injury. The other thing, though, is if you see grade four lesions or actually grade three lesions in the vertebral artery, oftentimes you can go ahead and as seen in these pictures here, go ahead and occlude the vertebral artery and thereby lower the stroke rate as a result of that. Now, the question is, when you identify a a blunt cerebrovascular injury, what do you do for it? And, you know, we're talking about treating them with antiplatelets and so forth, but what do you do for follow-up? What we do is Uh, oftentimes we'll repeat the imaging at seven to 10 days post-injury if the patient's still in the hospital. We won't bring them back seven to 10 days, but we'll do it if they're in the hospital. Oftentimes the grade one injuries had completely healed by day 10 and 27% of the grade two injuries are found to heal by day 10. So sometimes people don't need as long antiplatelet therapy if you found that they're healed. So you can get them off that antiplatelet therapy. Thereafter, therapy should be continued for anywhere from three to six months with usually repeat imaging at the three to six month time frame to assess the need for continued antithrombotic therapy. The thing is, in our institution, originally DSA had changed that practice. But again, what we've done is we've just kind of backed off from that and said that, well, maybe the, 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 the downside of antiplatelet therapy is not as bad as the downside of DSA. So we'll go ahead and treat patients with aspirin. What do we do now? Well, we should obtain a CTA in the following (coughs) situations. All patients who have a neurologic deficit without explanation on the head CT, patients who have a basilar skull fracture, patients with a Lafort two or three facial fracture, and a cervical spine fracture. And what we do is any cervical spine fracture, but certainly any fracture of C1 to C3, any fracture through the foramen transversarum, any subluxations or dish patients or craniocervical dislocation patients. There was a series out of Harborview that showed the the vertebral artery injury was well over 50% in craniocervical dislocations. The high mechanism of injury with a GCS less than seven or diffuse axonal injury, we'll also do a CTA if that's that's, um, the case. Now, what do we do if we find these? Well, in a BIFL one to two, we'll do antiplatelet or aspen therapy for three months, and then a repeat CTA of the head and neck in three months. If neurologic deficits initially, we'll institute heparin instead of, of aspirin with, uh, until things stabilize, and then we'll consider t- uh, weaning them over to aspirin. In a BIFL three injury, we'll often do um, aspirin immediately and then look at the angiogram for aneurysm assessment and close follow-up and consider treating it endovascularly depending on what the neuroradiologists think. For BIFL four and five injuries, we'll actually consider acute endovascular intervention such as sacking or, or sacrificing, I should say, the vertebral artery or actually stenting it if it's also a carotid injury. There are some unique considerations. You always got to consider the contralateral vertebral artery. And this is an important point to recognize. 
the one time I had an iatrogenic intraoperative vertebral artery injury, I know it's different than what we're talking about, but it's just an important anecdote to tell. What I found is that when we went ahead and took the vert on the side where we injured it, what we found is that the patient had very tight stenosis contralaterally at the takeoff of the contralateral vert. And we actually had to go in there and, and stent that tight stenosis because the patient became very symptomatic every time she set up. She sort of, you know, just almost passed out. So always got to consider if you're going to go ahead and take something, what the contralateral or uninjured vertebral artery is and what the posterior circulation is doing. And the other thing is, there, in a small, in a case of a small contralateral vertebral artery and concern of the posterior circulation flow, consider that stent. And that's why you want to get your endovascular colleagues involved in these things uh, quite early on. So in summary of this topic, basically the incidence overall of, of blunt cerebrovascular injury is up to 1% or even higher in some series in blunt trauma. It's imperative to have a screening protocol. I think you can't just ignore these things. I think you have to have a screening protocol for them because the morbidity and mortality can be high, up to 50% mortality in one series if you have a stroke. It appears that the, uh, the treatment decreases the stroke rate, and we recommend an aspirin. Usually a baby aspirin is sufficient. There is an equivalence in the literature of anti full anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. That's why we recommend aspirin. But again, we feel it's important to recognize, diagnose, and treat these patients when it occurs. Well, that's a brief review or quick review, I should say, of blunt cerebrovascular injury. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Andrew. This is really uh, commanding, and you've been involved in some of those uh, initial studies, so your expertise is much improved, uh, much uh, uh, appreciated. Quick question. So the usual scenario is when we have a patient with a nasty, let's say, displaced uh, C1, C2 translational injury, uh, there's a BIFL2 appearing. Uh, again, the usual scenario here is an MRA uh, with yeah. a questionable flow finding. Uh, the question now is, do we operate on this patient? Do we wait until this is kind of settled down? So uh, some people want to start anticoagulating. The onus is on us now to make a decision. Do we go to the OR or not? I'll put them on an aspirin and operate through aspirin. Okay. And what do you do with the aspirin? What do you tell the anesthesiologist to get ready? Uh, well, you know, if it's, if it's that quick, I mean, if you're trying to rush the patient to the, to the, to the hospital or to the OR that quickly, oftentimes we'll wait till the immediately post-operatively to start the aspirin. But let's say we've, we've made the diagnosis of the vertebral artery injury, and you're going to take the patient to the next, to the OR the next day or two, because they're neuro intact. I'll just start the aspirin right then and give them a full aspirin and just go ahead and operate through aspirin. Great. Uh, then the next question is, um, again, you answered the race, CTA or MRA. I mean, our vascular surgeons now, if we don't have a CTA, they look at us as if we're crazy. CTA. CTA. Yeah. And how much extra uh, time is used to the test? How much uh, dye load problems do people with, for instance, renal insufficiency have? You know, I don't honestly know the answer to that question. How much, how much problem is there for renal insufficiency patients? It doesn't really add time to the uh, problem because what we'll often do is make the, you know, you do these trauma slam sort of CTs where you've done head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, CTs, and then we'll just pull them out, give them dye and, you know, put them back in the scanner and do the CTA right there. If we diagnose the cervical fracture. Uh, Rod, do you have any questions or what? John, did I, you, I, sorry, have John. A, I have an observation, Rod, once you're done, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think anticoagulation is really important. And I think, you know, as we've experienced and we learn, I mean, we put everyone on heparin, um, you know, we try to get them to ambulate post up day one. So I think that anticoagulation we learned from our cerebrovascular colleagues is really important. And, and Andrew, I, I particularly resonated with your comments on the iatrogenic injury because I've yeah. been there too. But yeah. one thing I learned this year um, from one of my residents who's, who's heading into neurovascular, when you damage that vertebral artery, as you said, don't coagulate it, don't tie it off, pack it and get the, get the angiogram and possibly stent it, but don't pack it with gel foam glue. Yes. Don't pack it with avatine because that'll embolize pack it with cotton. That, that's the, exactly right. The cotton, Tampon won't, on it. the cotton won't embolize. Tampon on it. Don't embolize it. 